welcome to the introduction to Internet of Things or IoT um, workshop or just an introduction of the IoT, the basic fundamentals of the IoT. Um, um, first of all, my name is Akil. I'm one of the BOD of the Agents of Tech. And yep, that's it. So the first one is, um, what is IoT? So um, IoT is um, the Internet of Things, um, which in short form um, is IoT, describes the network of physical objects or things that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the internet. So um, things have evolved due to the convergence of uh, multiple technologies have been used in our daily basis. So um, real-time analytics, uh, machine learning, com commodity sensors, and also embedded systems are one of the systems that we have been using for quite a while now. And traditional fields of embedded systems, such as um, wireless network, wireless sensor networks, control system, automation, including home and building automation, and others are all contribute to enabling the Internet of Things. So in the consumer market, the IoT technology is most synonymous with products pertaining to the concept of the smart home. And you guys have probably heard of smart bulb and smart bell, smart bell, and there's a lot more um, of IoT devices in, in specifically in smart home. So including devices like um, lighting fixtures, thermostats, thermostats, um, home security systems, and also cameras, um, which is, we know, and we know it as um, CCTV and other home appliances that support one or more common ecosystems and can be controlled by devices um, such as our mobile device um, that is associated with, the, with that ecosystem, such as smartphones and also smart speakers. So um, this is uh, a video that uh, will show you the basic fundamentals of Internet of Things. Um, so just have a look at this video first.
Um, just a moment, guys. I will fix this uh, audio first. Right, sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so this should be going just fine with the audio. By now, you may have heard the term Internet of Things. Sounds interesting, but what does the Internet of Things actually mean? IoT is an evolution of mobile, home, and embedded applications that are being connected to the Internet, integrating greater compute capabilities, and using data analytics to extract meaningful information. Billions of devices will be connected to the Internet, and soon, hundreds of billions of devices. As related devices connect with each other, they can become an intelligent system of systems. And when these intelligent devices and systems of systems share data over the cloud and analyze it, they can transform our businesses, our lives, and our world in countless ways. Whether it's improving medical outcomes, creating better products faster with lower development costs, making shopping more enjoyable, or optimizing energy generation and consumption. Here's an example of the big picture. Imagine an intelligent device such as a smart traffic camera. The camera can monitor the road for congestion, accidents, and weather conditions, and communicate that status to a gateway that combines it with data from other cameras creating an intelligent city-wide traffic system. Now, imagine that intelligent traffic system connected to other city-wide transportation systems, which get data from their own intelligent devices, creating an ever larger intelligent system of systems. The really big possibilities come from analyzing the end-to-end -end data across that system of systems. For example, let's say the city's intelligent traffic system detects massive congestion due to an accident. That insight can be sent to the citywide transportation system, which can analyze the accident's impact on other city systems. Recognizing the accident is near the airport and two city schools, it could notify those systems so they can adjust flight and school schedules. It can also analyze and derive optimal routes around the accident and send those instructions to the city's digital signage system to guide drivers around the accident. And that's just one example of the potential benefits that can happen when intelligent devices share insight with other systems, forming ever-expanding systems of systems. But how do we... All right. 
Um, so that is that is so far the basic fundamentals on uh, the videos uh, really shares on the basic fundamentals or the ideas or the notions of um, what Internet of Things really is. And um, all right, continuing to the history of IoT. Um, so basically, the main concept of a network of smart devices was discussed as early as 1982 with a modified Coca-Cola vending machine at um, a university named Carnegie Mellon University, um, which was becoming the first internet connected appliance, uh, which able to report its inventory and whether newly loaded drinks were cold or not. So basically this machine are differentiating between um, is the co co Coca-Cola tin is cold or hot. So um, between 1993 and 1997, several companies proposed solutions like Microsoft's at work or Novel's Nest. So the field gained momentum when Bill Joy um, envisioned device-to-device -device communication as a part of his six webs framework presented at the World Economic Forum in 1999. So the term Internet of Things was coined by this guy right here, which is Kevin Ashton. Uh, which is a CEO of a company named Pro Procter & Gamble. So later in 1999, um, um, he coined the, the name in Internet of Things instead of Internet for Things, which he proposed earlier, earlier in the days. And at that point, he viewed that radio frequency identification, which is RFID that we all know probably by now, as an essential to the Internet of Things which would allow computers to manage all individual things. So defining the, the IoT as Internet of Things as simply the point in time when more things or objects or any devices were connected to the Internet than people. So Cisco Systems uh, estimated that IoT was born between 2008 and 2009, with the things and people ratio growing from 0 0.08 in 2003 to 1.84 in 2010. So basically, at um, in in 2010, uh, there is more devices connected than a human being in this whole world. All right, continuing to the components of IoT. So there are three components of IoT, which is devices, or they call Things. Um, so basically, things or devices are the primary physical objects that are being monitored. Smart sensors attached to these devices are continuously collecting data from the device and transmitting it to the next layer. So the latest um, advancement in this um, technology can produce micro smart sensors for various applications. So the second one is a user interface, which is um, we call it as UI. So user interfaces are uh, the visible or the tangible part of the IoT system, which can be accessible by the users. So designer, designers will have to make sure a well-designed user interface for minimum effort for users and encourage more interaction, interactions within their applications. And user interface design has higher significance in today's competitive market. Users will be interested in buying new devices or smart gadgets if it is um, user-friendly and also compatible with common connectivity standards in our mobile device, especially. And the third component is um, cloud, uh, which means data. So basically, IoT um, creates a massive data from devices, applications, and users, which must be managed in an efficient and organized way. So IoT cloud offers tools to collect, to process, manage, and also store a huge amount of data in real time. So industries and services can easily access this data remotely and make critical decisions when necessary. So basically, IoT Cloud is a sophisticated um, high-performance um, cloud network of servers optimized to perform high-speed data processing of um, devices and also tracking of the traffic management of devices and deliver accurate data analysis within a specific time. So distributed management um, database system are one of the indispensable components of IoT itself. So the third one is network interconnection. So um, the network interconnection um, is considered as one of the IoT's major significant trend in the recent years <coughs> in the explosive growth of devices and connected devices connected and controlled by the internet. So the wide range of applications for IoT technologies 
uh, means that the specifics can be very different from one device to the next, but there are basic characteristics shared by most. So there are many technologies that enable IoT. Um, crucial enough, network inter interconnection is one of um, the, the key rules that um, um, make um, IoT really functioning well in these days. All right, continuing to the IoT in industries. So IoT has been uh, really escalating the past five years, especially. So there are a lot of uses of IoT, not just for, for a smart home that we all really knew of, and not just, just for devices in smart home, but they are also um, um, offering inside a lot of industries such as um, IoT in healthcare. And this is uh, one of the uh, most important part in IoT. All right, um, so IoT for healthcare is actually, um, apart from um, monitoring patients' health, there are many other areas where IoT devices are very useful, especially in hospitals. So IoT devices tagged with sensors are used for tracking real-time location of medical equipment like wheelchairs, um, defibrillators, nebulizers, ox oxygen pumps, and other monitoring equipment. So deployment of medical staff at different locations can also be analyzed by using real time by using these few IoT devices. So the spread of infections is a major concern for patients in hospitals, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. So IoT enable hygiene monitoring devices help in preventing patients from getting infected. So IoT devices also help in asset management like pharmacy inventory control, and environmental monitoring for instance, like um, checking refrigerator temperature and humidity and also temperature control. So this one, um, the RFID that I just um, said to you guys just now, um, is actually used in healthcare also. So this RFID in healthcare, specifically in hospital is, um, so RFID is um, radio frequency identification um, that uses uh, radio frequency electromagnetic fields to identify the location of a hospital items carrying special text with the help of the readers located in hospital corridors. As you guys can see from this um, from this image, um, the doctor needs some item which has text on it on a specific location or maybe like a specific drawer or something. So basically they have to just go browse a um, an application <clears throat> and um, did, um, just go for that specific um, device and then just um, see where, where is it located um, using a map inside within the hospital itself. Um, so basically an active tech has an um, embedded power source. Basically they have a battery inserted on it, in it. So a passive tech uh, gets the energy from a reader's electromagnetic radiation. So a reader is a device receiving the radio waves from RFID text located within its reading range. So the reader transfers a command and emits energy to active a tech, and then the tech sends its info in response to the application that has been used in the hospital itself. So aside from this, uh, we also have IoT in smart cities. <clears throat> So um, one of the big aspects of uh, connected cars, like we see now, like uh, Tesla and there's a lot more, also like Porsche, Taycan and all. Uh, so these connected cars is that um, they will uh, be solving traffic and safety problems um, across major cities around the globe. So one, one of the most interesting opportunity regarding this uh, would be to get a traffic density mapping and en enable some sort of um, like dy dynamic dynamism in the way that it is um, handled by traffic lights at an intersection. So by using this way, um, based on the traffic volume, um, the signaling system can operate accordingly. So in relation to connected cars, blind spots can be eliminated to a maximum extent by using a camera also um, inside uh, the car. Um, so when cars are connected to each other, they can send and receive signals and constantly track the position of nearby vehicles, let's say within a 20, 20 meter radius. So, uh, and also lane departure warnings can be more accurate as compared to current sensor based implementation. So every, every year we witness so many accidents on road and many of them are caused by overtaking or lane changing without considering the vehicles in a blind spot from the driver's perspective. So by these uh, IoT technologies, we can hopefully reduce the amount of accident for these upcoming years. 
So aside from that, we also have IoT in agriculture. So the Internet of Things in agriculture has come up with a second wave um, of green revolution lately in the 2018. So the benefits that the farmers are getting by adapting IoT are twofold actually, uh, a lot more. So basically it has helped farmers to decrease their costs and increase yields at the same time by improving farmers' decision making with accurate and um, useful data. So this is one of the technology used in farming. They use ag agricultural drones. So what this drone actually does is like um, they will um, this technological adv advancement has almost uh, revolutionized and the agricultural operations and the introduction of agricultural drones is the trending disruptions. So the ground and aerial drones are used for assessment of crop health, crop monitoring, planting, crop spraying, and also field analysis. So basically this drone can also spray and can also monitor the, the type of um, fields used and also the crop monitoring uh, basically. So with proper strategy and planning based on real-time data, drone technologies like this has given a high rise and makeover to the agriculture industry. So drones with uh, thermal or multispectral sensors identify the areas that require changes in irrigations. So once the crop starts uh, growing, sensors indicate their health and calculate their vegetation uh, index. So eventually, um, smart drones have reduced the environmental impact. So uh, which leads, uh, which results to um, a massive reduction and also much lower chemical re re reaching the groundwater. So the next one is um, IoT in disaster management. So the, the use of IoT in disaster management can help us in predicting calamities, alerting authorities at an early stage, and also rescuing people affected by disasters. So thus uh, potentially saving lives, money, and of course uh, resources. So uh, most natural disasters are inevitable and unpredicted. So these disasters um, take a heavy toll, not only on our finances and other resources, but also on human lives. Um, be it like Australian bushfires, um, in Australia, of course, Cyclone Idai in um, Belgium, if I'm not mistaken, and also the erratic Indian mon monsoon. So these type of incidents have brought long substantial damages to a lot of people and a lot of population in certain specific area. So, they have caused a massive destruction to whatever came in their path. So I will show you um, one of the um, one of video um, regarding this uh, disaster management. Um, all right, I'll share my tab again. Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to talk to you about resilience. This is a picture of my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Nancy Staples, and she's leaning on the gate at the end of our gardens and the land that we worked um, two generations ago. My earliest childhood memories are of her and my great-grandmother and my grandfather, particularly this time of the year, trying to eke out every ounce of nutritional value and economic value from our gardens and from the land. It was a time to harvest, but it was a time to preserve, to jam, to pickle, in any shape, way or form, that nutritional value, so that we could take the bounty of the summer and extend it for us, our family, but also for the poorer members of the community around through the winter months. She was born at the beginning of one world war, lived through a second and survived polio. She was tough. And when I think about resilience, I think about her, her generosity, her toughness, and many like her in that generation. But let's talk about resilience today. This is a picture of the Hotel Montana, taken um, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, just after the devastating earthquake in 2010. 
As you can see, it pancaked, killing 200 people or more as it did so. It simply wasn't built to resist the shock. Today, we have to be more concerned about natural disasters than ever before. In the past 30 years, the economic losses from natural disasters have more than tripled. The number of natural disasters has actually doubled. Let's look at the numbers. Over the past 30 years, in low-income and middle-income countries alone, we have lost $1.2 trillion due to damage. That is equivalent to the GDP annually of Mexico. Another way to think of it is that it is equivalent to a third of all of the official development assistance that we've given in the same time period. So think that for every $3 of overseas development aid that we've given, we've taken one and thrown it away. In the same period, those same 30 years, 2.3 million people have perished. That's the population of Namibia. This is something that we need to pay attention to. And it's getting more difficult. Climate change is ravaging, especially poor countries. Already, this is not a phenomenon for the future. It's for us today. Already, countries are trying to work their way through the complex nexus between a food crisis, a water crisis, and an energy crisis. And climate change is just making it more difficult and raising uncertainty. At the same time, over the next 40 years, we will add 2.6 billion people to the cities of the world, most of that in developing countries. In fact, 90% of that growth will be in South Asia and Africa. And between now and 2050, we will double the number of people exposed to cyclones and mudslides and collapse as a result of natural disasters in urban settings to more than 1.5 billion people. The lack of building codes, the lack of enforced building codes, will punish these people. And it will be the poor, for it is always the poor, the most vulnerable, that will suffer most. So think of the story that we are beginning to understand. We have more and more disasters. Their intensity is being developed by climate change. Climate change is adding to uncertainty. And we have a path of urbanization that this civilization has never seen before. How do we invest in our resilience? Well, there are two key ways. First of all, we actually have to change our growth path. We need to move to a greener and more inclusive growth now. Every country can start on that journey. We must mitigate and adapt to climate change. At the same time, we need to invest in disaster risk management. Disaster risk management must be part of development, but it must also be considered a first line of defense against the uncertainty that is coming tomorrow. We need action in the public sector. We need frameworks and public policy. We need awareness and investment in the private sector. And we need civil society and communities to engage. Now, I talked to you earlier on about the hotel in Haiti, the Hotel Montana that had pancaked and collapsed. This is where we are today. This is the Western in Sendai, a gorgeous 37-story hotel that survived the catastrophic earthquake on March the 11th, 2011, the Great Japan Earthquake, with almost no damage at all. In fact, it served as a disaster response center. Disaster risk management is in the building code in Japan. Disaster risk management in the building code is enforced in Japan. Disaster risk management is part of the curricula in schools in Japan. And disaster risk management, not disaster, is part of the public discourse here in Japan. So every country, every government, can take steps now, no matter where they are on the development trajectory, to try to start to invest in their own resilience. But there's much more that can be done by the international community as well. Often, we offer too little, too late. Between 1980 and 2009, the international community spent 90 billion US dollars on disaster-related assistance. But of that 90 billion, only 3.6% 
was invested in prevention and preparedness. The other 96% plus was invested in emergency response and reconstruction. We have to change those numbers. We have to switch that graph around. In fact, we have to move from a tradition of response to a culture of prevention, a culture of resilience. But let me give you an example of what does seem to start working. This is the island of St. Lucia in the Caribbean, a small island developing state buffeted by storms and hurricanes, where landslides are unfortunately far too often part of the rhythm of life there. In 2008, the World Bank, working with five communities on the island, started to try to invest in the resilience of these communities and their ability to withstand and to avoid landslides. And we built these hillside drains. In 2010, when Hurricane Tomas hit the island, unfortunately, many communities suffered the landslides that are so, so often part of the rhythm of life there. But the five communities where these hillside drains had been built suffered no losses at all. It's important to understand the economics of this project as well. For every dollar that the community invested in these drains, it saved another three dollars that it would have had to spend on response and on reconstruction if they had not taken the steps towards preparedness. So if disaster risk resilience seems to make such good economic and business sense, is the private sector interested? Is the private sector investing? Well, the good news is that leaders are. This is a picture of the port of Cartagena in Colombia, which is operated by a private firm, Welles de Bosque, uh, on a long-term government concession. Recently, they undertook a study together with the International Finance Corporation, the private sector lending arm of the World Bank, where they looked at the risks to the port uh, operating environment from changes in climate and changes in weather pattern. What was interesting is that in order to get the data for the report, they had to go to 30 different public and private sources, which shows that there's much to be done to make the data and awareness of these issues more available to public and private sector alike. But the report resulted in recommendations from changing the dredging regime for the way that ships approach the port to drainage to on-side on, on land operations. So for example, changing the heights of roads and things like this. And as a result of those recommendations, Muelles de Bosque invested $30 million in new capital um, construction in order to make them more resilient, in order to improve, their, uh, and to improve their operations going forward. So this port company was able to see the benefit from investing in their ability to be resilient going forward, and that this was a commercial advantage to them. So I've talked about the public sector and I've talked about the private sector. And now we need to talk about community. We know empirically that communities that have stronger social bonds do better in disaster. We know that, in fact, those strong social bonds are one of the strongest determinants of resilience within the community. I mean, it makes intuitive sense. Neighbors know which neighbor needs help, which neighbor is vulnerable which neighbor is weakest. We also know that families, neighbors, and friends are the ones that help reconstruct first after disaster has hit. And so when we think of resilience, this is not an adapt construct. It's not, it's not, an, it's not a, just a word that is thrown around in development circles. Resilience is both the need for public policy and the need for private investment. It's also about a different response from the international community, and it is about the local municipal leaders, the mayors that we elect to lead us through these uncertain times. But resilience, very importantly, is about community. I think the people of Japan know that. I think that my grandmother, her friends, and others in our community when I was growing up knew that too. And so for me personally, when I think of resilience, I think of top-down policy and investment flows, but I think of bottom-up building of community. For me, resilience is about you and me and the bonds that bring us together. Thank you.
All right. So basically, from um, the video that you were saying, that you were saying before, is um, um, showing you how important um, planning for the future or disaster, man, uh, disaster management um, in Internet of Things or majorly uh, known as um, um, AI or artificial intelligence um, has come into place when it comes to disaster management and how bad it could be um, to our. Um, future generation if we are not taking it, it seriously. So basically, planning for the future um, um, is actually one of the most important um, um, things that we need to consider the most. Um, talking um, um, on behalf of the disaster management just now. So artificial intelligence and also data analytics tools can be used for predictive analysis. So these tools help to predict the type of disasters, the severity of the disasters, and the time it can strike with higher accuracy. Thus, authorities, uh, authorities and government um, and also rescue personnel will be better pre prepared to take suitable measures. So the losses in terms of financials and human lives can be reduced significantly through predictive analysis. Similarly, IoT de devices can also be used to improve manual disaster management techniques and also help in decreasing the risk exposure of rescue personnel. Augmented and also virtual reality devices can be leveraged to provide training and um, to disaster management forces. So various real life scenarios can be stimulated using these technologies to train individuals about the due course of action. These devices help minimize risk and injuries caused during traditional training sessions and also helps to improve the effecti effectiveness of training procedures. So basically, you can stop the cert certain disasters from happening, but you can become better prepared to handle them. So IoT can help overcome inefficiencies in the reactive approach currently using in disaster management procedures. IoT devices can also um, even help avert crises altogether that cause due to human errors. And governments across the world need to increase the use of IoT in disaster management, considering all the benefits and improvement they bring. And improvement in technologies such as AI, robotics and computer visions, data analytics and machine learning will help further improve IoT's capabilities in specifically saying from uh, disaster management. So it will make disaster response more, more efficient, thereby helping minimize the substantial loss, losses. So coming up next um, to the applications of AOT, IoT, I'm sorry. So um, basically there are three parts, which is uh, to the B2B consumers, um, which is ours. Um, our, I mean like the community or population in, in certain countries and specific market segmentation and also industry and farming. And the third one is infrastructure and the fourth one is commerce. Um, so basically B2B consumers uh, consist of um, the, the demand on smart homes, smart appliances and also elderly care. So for the industry and farming, um, it consists of smart manufacturing, such as um, the one I've shown you just now, like the drone and the technologies that they have used in the agriculture um, sector, and also um, smart agriculture. And the third one is infrastructure, like smart cities, smart energy and utilities, like um, using um, using electric based car, like um, Porsche Taycan, um, Teslas, like we all know. And by using this uh, smart energy and utilities, um, you can hopefully also reduce the carbon um, exposed to the, to the air. And also environmental monitoring, like the disaster management itself. And the, the fourth one is uh, commerce, um, which means in business side. So it will also help in the medical and healthcare sec sector and also transportation and also building a lot of automations out of artificial intelligence. So um, <clears throat> there is, um, so I'll be speaking um, just a little bit of the benefits of smart homes. So I'll show another videos about uh, what smart home really is because not everyone really knows what a smart home is.
A smart home or building uses devices connected via the internet to allow for remote monitoring and management of appliances and systems. Smart home technology, also known as home automation, provides homeowners with added security, convenience, and energy efficiency. It allows them to control smart devices simply with an app on their smartphone or other networked device. Smart homeowners can control lighting systems remotely, schedule and monitor thermostats, grant or deny home access through smart locks, check in on security cameras, and even brew coffee remotely. Machine learning and artificial intelligence systems powered by Amazon, Google, and Apple also contribute to a smart home. Beyond the smart home is the smart building, which is very much the same but on a grander scale, with a focus on lighting, energy, thermostats, and security. As with any new technology, vendors are still working to address security and complexity concerns, and those remain challenges to adoption despite smart technology's convenience and efficiencies. So that's it for the uh, basic or the basic ideas or notion of um, what um, smart home really is. Um, okay. All right. Um, so um, continuing to the benefits of smart homes. So basically, these are top three of um, benefits of uh, smart homes, which is access and control from anywhere over the internet within the application that is provided by a certain uh, brand or company, maybe like Google on. Um, Google and also, yeah, basically Google has been producing a lot of um, IoT devices and also security monitoring. So um, you you guys might be wondering that um, there's probability that the security um, might have been leaked or breached um, within the usage of um, the IoT devices within the application itself. But um, it turns out that um, they have a proper proper and also an organized um, law and also an organized uh, systematic um ways in the application to ensure that the security security monitoring is um ensured uh, within the users users inside the application so and the third one is economy power usage optimization which could save a lot of energy in terms of um carbon from cars and <clears throat> and also um from um optimizing and fully utilizing electricity um from the sun itself and then um, the future scope of IoT. Um, yep, for this one, I also have um, a short video to show you guys. Possibilities. When everything becomes linked with everything else, matter becomes mind and the possibilities become endless. Imagine 50 billion IoT connected devices by 2020. Now, imagine the economic impact of these connected machines. Four to eleven trillion dollars per year by 2025. Wearable devices, environmental sensors, agricultural machinery, components in a vehicle or devices in homes can all be connected to deliver insights and drive transformation. So imagine if you had smart devices in your home, your car, your workplace, or even in yourself. The world becomes alive. That's Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is making everyday objects into data factories. When Internet of Things, along with big data, meets artificial intelligence, 
this interface will become enlivened with intelligence and a new world will take birth which will increasingly talk back to us. Imagine the kind of world that it would be. Imagine the revolution into will usher in the way we see the world. The external world will become the extension of our mind, like an extension of our thoughts. Imagine a world that is responsive, a world that is optimized for human creativity, a world that is intelligent. The Internet of Things is a breeding ground for new AI-driven solutions and experiences, from self-driving cars to intelligent homes to health. Welcome to the world of endless possibilities. Welcome to AI and IoT Summit. Right, so that's pretty much for the future or um on how the IoT devices will be uh, used um, pretty much on the rough surface side um, for the upcoming future. Um, so these are the three um, major um, major sectors that um, future scopes of IoT, I mean the, the future use of IoT will be considered on, uh, which is energy, security, and also real time. So these are pretty much uh, the three main things that the IoT devices or IoT technologies will consider um, in the near future. So um, these are the statistics um, um, that shows that by the year of 2020, there will be a lot more connected devices than people on Earth. Uh, by the year of 2020, which is last year, there has been uh, a lot more devices connected to the internet um, as compared to human being in the world. Um, all right, so uh, coming up next to the um, <clears throat> um, all right, just to, to say to you guys on the future outlook of um, what future scopes of IoT is. So, according to the Fortune uh, Business Insights, the global Internet of Things market was valued at um, at USD. 190 billion in 2018 and is projected to reach um, thousand. Thousand, thousand billions uh, by 2026. And advanced principal, principal technologies and the usage of devices have helped fuel the growth of IoT technologies. So in fact, um, investments in IoT technologies are projected to grow at 13.6% per year through 2022. Further growth in the coming years will be possible uh, thanks to the new sensors um, and also the computing power and also the and also to the reliable mobile connectivity so finally the the iot market will grow because the existence of the iot devices will need to be linked to the iot growth in uh, traditional connected it devices is admittedly moderate about two percent per year however the installed base of more than five billion smartphones two billion personal computers and also 1 billion tablets indicate a massive market for device integration. Um, <clears throat> so the conclusion of uh, for the future scope of IoT, the future of IoT is um, um, virtually unlimited or unprecedented, let's say, due to advances in technology and consumers desire to integrate devices such as smartphones with household machines and appliances. Um, a networking and also connectivity protocol has made it possible to connect people and machines on all platforms. Also, there is uh, much data traveling from devices to devices. Um, security is another key concern that will need to be addressed to keep up with the demands for the users. From an individual's perspective, IoT offers an excellent career opportunities. However, it requires you to have the necessary skill, which is going to be the key differentiator to everyone else. Right. Um, so some of these, uh, um, some of the advantages of um, IoT, which is information access, um, which you guys can probably get an information um, pretty much anywhere in inside and within the application or software for specific devices. Communication 
between um, one device to one device within the internet connection, automation, cost effective, and also security. And there's also the disadvantages or the drawbacks of IoT devices specifically. Um, some of it are also the privacy implications, which um, you guys, uh, which I've already said before that um, the privacy uh, might have the tendency to reach out to the third party companies and also to the un um, unwanted users and also the hackers. Lah. And autonomy and control concerns, data storage, um, security and safety, and also environmental impact in electronic devices, which um, is considered as an environmental action nowadays. Um, yep, I think um, that's all for um, our short introduction to Internet of Things workshop as for today. So thank you for sticking around um, throughout the whole um, workshop session. So, so any questions that you guys uh, might want to ask? And also don't forget to um, scan this uh, QR barcode right here, which is um, a feedback form um, for this um, specific um, introduction to Internet of Things workshop. So please scan this um, feedback form just to give out feedbacks on how the um, workshop of um, the introduction of Internet of Things has been going for you guys. So any questions you guys uh, might wanted to ask, maybe not for IoT, maybe for other stuff, uh, maybe for our club itself, Agents of Tech. Just anything you had in mind. Yep, I think so far there has, uh, okay, isn't it dangerous if everything is connected to internet, once get hacked and so on. Yep, like I said before, it could be a pros and it could be a cons to specifically, specifically saying from the security side. So it could be an advantage, uh, at, an advantage for IoT devices and it could be a disadvantage, disadvantage or drawbacks, um, one of drawbacks um, for internet of things. So it really depends um, on how the system or the application and also how the government have to deal with um, this uh, sort of uh, law and legislations behind Internet of Things um, devices. And I think that of course going to be um, data breach on um, specifically saying um, to the hacker if um, you guys are connecting within a certain internet connection. So is there any questions yet? Uh, 
I'm not sure you guys heard of industrial internet of things. Can I say the difference? Um, yes, I've heard of uh, industrial internet of things, but I can't really show uh, you guys the difference of um, industrial internet of things because um, it is um, still new, newly developed and it's still in the middle of um, developing it into and also to proposing, propose it in the market, in the technology market. And as far as I can, I can um, say, um, the industrial internet of things um, has a lot to do with uh, the Elon Musk. Um, he's basically conquering the whole industrial internet of things, IIoT. So, yep, that's basically it. So any questions left? All right, I think uh, there's still no uh, questions left uh, to be answered. And I think thank you very much um, for you, all of you guys to uh, stick around uh, with me for the whole journey, for the whole session of this workshop. So, yep, thank you very much for attending and I'll see you guys in the future um, and also upcoming event from Agents of Tech. Thank you very much.